Okay, so um, I want to welcome everybody. Um, my name is Aaron Kesselheim. Uh, on behalf of myself and my uh, co-director, Leah Rand, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us for the uh, February Health Policy and Bioethics Consortia. Um, I'm a professor of medicine at uh, Harvard Medical School and, um, and within my research group, the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law in association with the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. Um, we organize this um, this series, and uh, and this month are thrilled to be able to have our colleagues and collaborators from the Petrie Flom Center um, uh, help out with this one and and help organize this one. So I want to turn the floor over to Carmel Shakar, the uh, the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center, to tell us a bit about about this month's event. Um, thank you very much, and uh, Carmel, take it away. Thank you, Aaron. I want to say welcome to all of you. It's always a pleasure to collaborate on a session of the consortium. I think that the topic this year is especially interesting and relevant and challenging. We all know that there are serious health disparities between people of color and other patients in this country. The first thing that comes to mind are the really shocking differences between outcomes for maternal and fetal health for women of color giving birth. There was recently a study that suggested that outcomes are better for newborn and women of color when they are served by physicians who come from the same communities that they do. And some of that may relate to medical stereotypes, which is the topic for today, how patients are perceived and treated by medical practitioners. Before I get to the all-star lab, just a few notes of housekeeping. There will be a significant moderated discussion. We are very, very excited to welcome your questions into the moderated discussion. How do you get a question to the moderated discussion, you might be asking? That is very easy. You have one of two ways. The first and probably best way is to use the Zoom Q&A box, which if you type a question in, our moderator, who I'll introduce in a minute, will be reviewing those questions and will direct them to our panelists. We also hope that you'll join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag medical stereotypes. Again, that's hashtag medical stereotypes. If you have a question there, Petrie Farm Center staff will pull it and put it in the Zoom Q&A. Ways that you cannot submit a question, please don't try to use the Zoom chat feature. That's not how we're going to be receiving questions. And the Zoom raise hand feature is really cute, but again, we will not be monitoring that. So please do not use that. The Zoom Q&A is really the best way to go about things. With that, I'm so very excited to introduce everybody who's going to be participating in today's event. Our moderator today is Michelle Morse, MD, MPH, who is an internal medicine hospitalist at Brigham and Women's Hospital in the Division of Global Health Equity, an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. She co-founded Equal Health, an organization that builds critical consensus and collective action globally towards achieving health equity, as well as the social medicine Medicine Consortium and the Global Campaign Against Racism. She was previously the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Partners in Health and now serves on their board. From September 2019 to January 2021, she served as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Fellow and worked with the Ways and Means Committee, majority staff on health equity. Our speakers today will be Craig Knopf, who is Associate Professor of Law at University of Colorado Law School. He is an expert in health and civil rights law, and he teaches health law, property law, and sexuality and the law. His publications have appeared in Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, the Stanford Law Review, among others. As professor, he has filed briefs in the Supreme Court on LGBT rights issues, representing advocacy organizations and other professors. He's also a former Deputy Solicitor General with the California Department of Justice, where his docket primarily involved cases before the United States Supreme Court. He holds a JD from Yale and a Master's of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge. He also clerked on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Craig also was our guest editor 
records the Petrie Farm Center's blog, The Bill of Health, Digital Symposium on Race and Health, which I suggest if you're interested in this topic, there are some really fantastic entries that you go look up, look it up. Again, that's Bill of Health blog from the Petrie Farm Center. Last but certainly not least, we have Evelyn Hammond, who is chair of the Department of the History of Science and the Barbara Guthman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science and Professor of African and African American Studies. She's the author of Childhood's Deadly Scourge, the Campaign to Control Diphtheria in New York City. She co-edited Gender and Scientific Authority. She has published articles on the history of disease, race, and science, African American feminism, African American women, and the epidemic of HIV AIDS, and analyses of gender and race in science and medicine. She was named a Sigma Chi Distinguished Lecturer. She has been a visiting scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin and a fellow in the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. In July 20, 2005, Professor Hammonds was named Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity at Harvard University. And in March 2008, she was named Dean of Harvard College. She earned her PhD at Harvard in the Department of History of Science, an SM in Physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a BEE in Electrical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, the BS in Physics from Spelman College. She taught at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology before coming to Harvard. While at MIT, she was the founding director of the MIT Center for the Study of Diversity in Science, Technology, and Medicine. She has also been a visiting professor at UCLA and Hampshire College. Thank you so much, the three of you, for joining us. I will now turn the floor over to Craig to begin our event. Uh, thank you so much, Carmel. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, working with you again. Um, it was so wonderful um, having a chance to uh, collaborate on the series on race and health. Um, and really, I want to clarify that it was Carmel and Chloe from the from the from the Petrie Farm Center who did really the lion's share of the work. And I can't say how grateful I am to them for that uh, excellent project. Uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, um, Aaron and Leah who um, put together this event um, and uh, just to say how honored I am to be among uh, in, in such illustrious company um, Evelyn Michelle a real pleasure to be here with you um, so uh, I, I come at this uh, this issue obviously from the perspective of law um, I um, I only have a, a JD um, as, a, as a terminal degree um, and my focus is really thinking about the way in which law um, has relies upon medical medicine um, to produce uh, certain outcomes and to develop certain relationships between minorities um, and, and society more generally. Um, I, I came at this project largely um, from a slightly different perspective. Um, so I went to law school to be an LGBT rights activist. And um, I wrote a little bit about the history of the LGBT movement and uh, medicine, uh, and I realized that historically the relationship was rather fraught and the early LGBT rights movement rejected uh, any formal in, uh, relationship collaboration with the medical establishment. Uh, that has changed dramatically in the last few decades uh, and LGBT activists have increasingly begun to draw on relationships with the medical establishment to, uh, to, to, to leverage further rights. Uh, and as I began to think about that more generally, um, I uh, began to write about how various groups in general used medical framing to advance legal claims. And that was partially because the law itself recognized medical harms as creating, uh, as being able to create certain claims on the government. Uh, and, uh, and so I wrote a lot about how um, in many cases, using medicine allowed individuals to claim greater rights, benefits, uh, and other uh, kinds of um, um, matters, um, how, how, they, how they could do so um, using um, medical framing. Um, but one thing I was pressed on and one thing that I was quite cognizant of was that when minorities began to press uh, medical framing, they actually were not very successful and sometimes uh, the 
uh, claim would backfire and would actually harm minorities. And so um, I wanted to think about that issue. Um, and I went and looked at the literature and there's so much literature out there on, on how um, medicine has betrayed minorities in various ways. Um, and I wanted to try and integrate the literature more um, into, uh, from a more theoretical point of view, um, because the work on this is, is truly excellent. Um, and I did not really feel that um, adding to um, the excellent historical and sociological research on this front would, would, would add much. Um, so, um, so, so, so to do that, I really began um, with um, a structure developed by um, Iris Marion Young, who's uh, fairly well known, as many of you may know, a political and um, a, a political philosopher. And uh, Young argued that oppression in society um, takes uh, five forms. The in, in a famous essay called uh, "The Five Faces of Oppression." Um, first, uh, she argued that um that that, that uh, uh first she argued that the first face of oppression so to speak is powerlessness um in this in this situation um and I call it domination. In this situation, the argument is that the, a certain group is painted as not having autonomy, not having the ability to, for example, make decisions for themselves, and it and 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 that it is necessary uh, for um, uh, society in general to make decisions for the group um, to to determine um, what their life course should look like. Uh, the second phase of oppression, uh, she argues, is exploitation. Um, and exploitation occurs when there's a process that transfers the results of the labor of some people to benefit others. Um, and the injustice here is not just in the division of wealth, but in the fact that the relationship involves this transfer, um, where the energy of the have-nots is expended to maintain the power um, and the status and the wealth of those who have. Um, and then third, there is exclusion. Exclusion basically is designed to keep a group out of certain parts of society or, or all of society for that matter. So you can have African Americans or women excluded from certain jobs or foreigners excluded from entering the country completely. Um, now, Young also refers to two other forms of oppression. Um, what she refers to is, uh, um, as cultural oppression um, and violence. Um, but to my mind, uh, both of these are meant to achieve uh, domination, exclusion, and exploitation. Uh, cultural oppression refers to being able to use symbols to, for example, um, you know, certain colored skin is marking you as belonging to a different group. Well, that is used in context to dominate, to oppress, uh, to, to exploit, and to exclude. And similarly, violence and other forms, I think, of material um, harm uh, can be used to achieve uh, exploitation, exclusion, and domination. So, so really, my my essay sort of centers around uh, exclusion, exploitation, and and domination. Um, I then go back to think about how these uh, three uh, forms of oppression were instantiated uh, in medical contexts, um, and I and, and I and I go back specifically to the 19th century because this is when early the, the modern forms of medicine and medical institutions were being developed, um, and then modern forms of medical knowledge uh, came into play. You know, understandings of infectious disease, the development of the AMA, all of this sort of came together to create the medical profession and medical knowledge as we know it today. Um, as those forms of medical knowledge were being developed, they were also being integrated into existing theories of race. And uh, to give just a few examples, I, I want to emphasize, especially because I'm on a panel with uh, a, 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 not just a real life history professor, but a very prominent and well-known history professor. Uh, I'm not painting this as history or as doing history in any way. It's, it's really scattered examples that I'm still unsure about including within within the article um, as to how in the early years of the development of the medical profession um, uh, ideas about minority uh, about, about medicine and minorities began to be integrated into medical knowledge uh, so first there was the argument that um, black people were inferior and dependent on whites due to physi physiological and mental criteria 
Um, and, uh, and, so, and so you have this from uh, Thomas Jefferson, um, who um, argued that, uh, that African Americans uh, had inferior reasoning and imagination. Um, and, and, and this sort of translated very much into policy. Um, so legislators in Congress argued that because of these physical differences, three um, premise, uh, th three, three points had to follow. Number one, abolition of slavery was impossible because black people were reliant on white people in the symbiotic relationship that required them to continue to um, work um, wor work for, um, for, for white people. Second, slavery was a necessity, even in new territories, um, and that fugitive and third, fugitive slave laws were necessary. Right, so, it, so, so, so these arguments were brought to bear in these three political um, and policy sets of arguments. So um, one speech, for example, contained references to no less than 25 doctors and naturalists, as uh, many of them referred to it, were referred to at the time, including um, several professors from um, Harvard uh, Medical School. Um, and the idea was that uh, all of these scientists were in agreement that the different complexions among uh, these various groups also correlated to physical intrinsic differences, um, and uh, and 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 that uh, and that this meant that uh, black people had to be dominated in a certain way, and their life outcomes had to be determined. Ironically, even as these arguments move forward, the idea that that was mental inferiority that required guidance and, uh, and domination. At the same time, there was this idea that uh, black people were invulnerable to certain kinds of medical conditions and therefore could be exploited. Um, so, so first, the idea was that, well, you know, using black labor instead of white labor was humanitarian to the white laborers, right? But the other part of it was that the constitution of black people was that, quote, he can remain with his feet in the water and his head exposed to the hottest sunshine without injury to his health, right? Um, and, and so it was actually humane to black people because they would, many of them, some argued, would return of their own accord to slavery um, to, to, to continue to work in, um, in, in, in professions that were suitable uh, to them. Um, and, and so there was this idea that, um, that, that, that because black people were mentally inferior um, and therefore were dependent, at the same time they were physically superior and therefore could be exploited. And so medicine was used um, in both ways. Um, and, and, this, and, I, and I want to make one, one point regarding intersectionality here. Um, so you have this legacy of experimentation, uh, uh, this legacy that you know, black people were invulnerable medically in certain ways. Uh, and that was actually used to justify experimentation on black people. I think most famously um, by James Marion Sims, who's referred to as the father of gynecology. Uh, and he would perform experiments as he has been well documented by, uh, by very able historians on this front on, on black women including surgical procedures without anesthesia. Um, uh, and, and the idea was, uh, as Angela Davis uh, puts it, uh, this is a supreme irony of slavery. In order to pre uh, approach its strategic goal, to extract the greatest possible surplus from the labor of slaves, the black woman had to be released from the chains of the myth of femininity that, end quote, that, that, that rendered her uh, vulnerable in various ways. So there was this idea that her blackness overwhelmed um, her, her feminine, uh, feminine Femininity. And then finally, there was the idea that various, um, various racial groups were contagious and therefore had to be excluded. Um, and, and, and this contagion narrative uh, really reached its pinnacle um, after the Civil War. So during the antebellum era, the, uh, there was a greater focus on the physical differences argument because the idea was that black people and white people lived in integrated communities um, that, that helped achieve exploitation and domination. You had to be close to the subject of exploitation and domination to be able to direct their life choices um, and at the same time extract labor from them. But once slavery was no longer legal, legal 
Um, we, this is the, the, the legal, I mean, and, and again, there are various historians who talk about this. Um, uh, there were various narratives developed to continue to justify, um, to, uh, to justify oppression. And so as one historian um, notes, segregation would have been an inconvenience to the function of slavery. Um, but um, after slavery ended, um, the point was uh, that new narratives had to be developed to justify um, um, oppression. Uh, and, and that narrative was that black people um, were contagious in various ways. Um, and, um, and, and that contagion to some degree um, involved you know, the transmission of, of disease. But really the focus was on eugenic, eugenic contagion. The idea that because um, black people were um, physically inferior, that by, um, by interacting and, um, and uh, it, with, with white people, um, uh, that would lead overall to, um, to, to, to mixed race uh, children and um, subsequently um, to an adulteration of the white race. So these three narratives of oppression, of uh, domination, of uh, exploitation, and of exclusion correspond to specific medical narratives. Domination corresponded to ideas of physical and mental inferiority. Exploitation corresponded to ideas of medical erasure. These groups do not, cannot suffer from medical harm. And exclusion corresponded to what were at the time new ideas of contagion, both pathogenic through pathogens, of course, and, um, and eugenic, the idea that, uh, that that interbreeding of the races could uh, produce um, harm, specifically for the white race. Um, these ideas, uh, I argue, remain um, extant today. Um, and, and we see this especially when minorities seek to use the language of medicine to obtain certain benefits. Now, um, in the paper, I point to uh, specific examples of um, women and the L LGBT groups using medicine. I, I think that um, racial minorities have been more reluctant to do so I, because I think that medicine has been particularly hostile to racial minorities. But, but this has um, come up maybe in a couple of contexts. Um, one uh, would have been the uh, controversy over the approval of Bidel. Again, extremely well documented, I think most prominently by Dar Dorothy Roberts uh, in the legal context, but of course, um, numerous other scholars um, in, in, in medicine and sociology. Um, and, and, and as most of you will know, uh, this controversy involved the approval of a drug uh, that was uh, supposed to specifically treat heart disease in African Americans. Um, and there were very various problems with the study that I will not go into, um, including assumptions of uh, biological difference between, between races. Um, but one of the um, interesting aspects here was that the NAACP um, and numerous um, other black and um, uh, minority advocacy uh, groups supported um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the vital studies, um, to my mind, because they felt that this would um, help achieve uh, greater visibility of racial minorities in medicine. The second example I think about is very recent, the use um, of race, to, uh, of, of medicine to frame um, uh, racism in, in, as, as a virus um, and as a public health problem. Um, and and we, ha we see many uh, policymakers around the country framing racism as a virus. Um, and, uh, and, and, so, and so we do see minorities and uh, minority advocates integrating language of medicine, the language of medicine into um, the, the framing of, um, of, of racial harm. Um, and, and, I, and I argue that uh, while this happens, we still see um, problems relating to um, the me medicine and race that sort of duplicate what we saw um, in, in previous centuries. Um, again, we see narratives of inherent medical differences, and I actually won't talk about that too much because I suspect that Professor Hammonds will talk about that in, in greater detail. Um, there's also the narrative of a medical erasure, um, the idea that um, African-Americans are, are less subject 
um, to, to various kinds of medical harm. Um, a 2016 study revealed that uh, medical students um, continue to believe um, that um, black people have thicker skin or feel less pain. Um, the, the narrative in the COVID-19 epidemic that African Americans, this is an early, early narrative, before there was any evidence in, the presumption was that African Americans could not or had greater, uh, had more susceptible, uh, had less susceptibility to COVID. Though, of course, the evidence proved that uh, completely wrong. Um, and then uh, finally, um, and, and I suspect, again, Professor Hammonds will talk more about this, but then the final point I want to make here is the narrative of contagion. Um, and uh, this, of course, was quite obvious when, uh, when, when um, COVID um, transmission was collapsed with being Asian. Um, early on in the epidemic. Um, and, and, and it really followed um, sometimes word for word narratives of uh, Chinese contagion from the early 19th century, sorry, the early 20th century that was used to justify uh, keeping uh, Chinese individuals outside the country or Chinese immigrants outside the country. That narrative was duplicated here when we talked, when, when um, some of the highest levels of policymakers in the land talked about the Chinese virus, etc. Um, but of course, uh, there are con there continue to be narratives, if not of eugenic contagion, but cultural contagion. Um, the idea that if undesirable elements move to a neighborhood, the metaphor of medicine is used to suggest that there may be a spread of undesirable and unhygienic habits um, from uh, certain groups of individuals to the white suburbs. Um, that was leveraged actually quite recently. Um, so, uh, so those narratives continue to remain. So how do we address it? Now, um, I, I don't want to go into detail here, but, but, in, but, but legal scholars, and I see I have maybe about three, four minutes remaining, uh, legal scholars uh, talk about various strategies uh, to address these harms. Um, the first is they discuss, um, and, and all of those strategies, surprise, surprise, given that we are uh, uh, legal scholars, focus on modulating legal institutions in some way or the other. The first is, the first is really, let's just stop dealing with medicine altogether. Law, let's try and insulate law from medicine. Um, and let's just try and focus on civil rights laws, right? And, I, and this is a bit of a caricature of the position, but the, um, but the idea is really to exclude medicine from these conversations as much as possible, because medicine is harmed far more than it has helped. Uh, the other is, you know, let us use medicine um, but but we, we want to use medicine to leverage legal solutions. So for example, uh, let us use medicine to talk about how housing is important and then turn to housing rights laws to achieve um, solutions. And the third is medical enforcement. So let us use the law to uh, enforce uh, civil rights anti-discrimination statutes against medical professionals, against other kinds of institutions. Uh, and I think all of this is very important. I actually think that uh, using, um, you know, uh, using the law to prosecute discrimination, for example, I think is, is, is an appropriate and important outcome. But I actually don't think that it'll be a lasting solution because much of the problem lies within medicine. Uh, and I think, uh, so, so, so my suggestion is to leverage social justice narratives that have begun appearing within medicine to achieve uh, solutions. And by these social uh, justice narratives, I think one prominent um, example are, is, is the conversation around social determinants of health. Uh, this audience, I don't think, needs a further, uh, a, a further conversation about social determinants of health. But, but I do, do want to point to, for example, um, how these social determinants have been integrated into, for example, ICD codes, right? So so-called Z codes today um, include, um, in, in, in include, for example, lack of housing, lack of, lack of employment as, um, as ICD um, um, terms, as ICD, uh, as ICD diagnoses. Now, they, they are underused. They, they cannot really be used uh, independently. Um, and I think that these are actually problems that we have to think about um, separately. Um, but I th one, one of the issues here, I think, is that there's no integration of minority harm and minority oppression within medical language in a formal way. So, uh, for example, when COVID-19 hit and Asian Americans began to experience hate crimes, um, uh, an, an article asked, is there an ICD code for racism? 
um, and, um, and, and that article um, received an unprecedented number of searches. Um, and, and, and I actually don't argue that there should be a specific ICD code for racism. Um, but what I do believe is that there should be some kind of category for minority-based oppression. Um, I don't think it should be focused on race because I think that can feed back into narratives of racial inferiority. Um, but I do think that by understanding that oppression harms certain groups more than others, um, uh, it, th that understanding should be integrated into medicine and should be leveraged specifically um, by racial minorities. Um, and I talk a little bit about how um, medical policy and, and, and broader policy can change uh, when this integration occurs. Um, I do have some concerns. Um, one, one concern um, involves uh, the fact that we see uh, various groups such as religious, um, uh, r religious majorities arguing that they are oppressed. Um, and, and, and I worry sometimes that these groups might, uh, just, just as they have co-opted narratives of oppression in the law, they might co-opt narratives of oppression in medicine. I think it would be harder to do to the extent that medicine today at least relies on empiricism to a greater degree. Um, but I do think that that is a danger. I also think that I'm just not thinking about enough, in enough ways to uh, integrate um, narratives of oppression in medicine. Of course, there's medical education, uh, but, but, um, but, but what else uh, can be done to, to achieve this? Um, so I'm playing around with ideas of, of, of changing medical standards, medical codes of conduct and the like, um, but I appreciate comments, uh, suggestions, and of course, any, any critiques, um, because I'm sure there could be several. So thank you so much uh, for giving me a chance to talk about this, um, and I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Conneth. I think we're heading straight into Professor Hammond's comments and then um, I'll make a few summative comments and then we'll open it up for kind of a moderated discussion and Q&A. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. I hope everybody can see that. Okay, great. So thank you, uh, happy to be here today for this conversation uh, and a number of things that, that uh, Craig has already raised, uh, I will address from my own perspective uh, in this uh, discussion and I'm really looking forward to the, to the Q&A and the, the conversation. The way that I go into this story is, uh, as Craig did, uh, looking at the history and, and, the, and, and really we have to begin certainly by at 1619 but certainly moving forward from 1619 into the 19th century. And in this, I, I think about it as the physician's Negro. And by saying that, I, I'll explain that in, in just a minute uh, about what I mean. But it's based on the idea that there were major anatomical, physiological, psychological differences between blacks and whites was commonly accepted by white physicians throughout the 19th century. And from the colonial period forward, what happened is that white physicians had assiduously cataloged these differences. Even as they moved from a natural history tradition to a more formal comparative anatomy, by the late 19th century, the physical body continued to play a contradictory role in making race real. And here I'm interested in ideas about race and how ideas about uh, racial differences are being constructed in the body of what the physicians, uh, that creates this notion of the physician's Negro. So I began by considering how the practice of racial comparison produces the category Negro. And the Negro that peopled medical texts in this period was really some kind of artifactual constructed category of social knowledge. Of course, it had material weight in the lives of, of real African-American peoples. But these racial categories and identities were embodied in political practices, certainly of discrimination and law, as Craig just noted. It affected people's access to education, medical care, and various forms of subjective experience. And the medical language was enc encoded. And as a language, it had political, social, as well as intellectual consequences. So I want to suggest the physician's Negro, 
this object that was constantly being compared to white should not be considered a rep representation of real African Americans because this Negro is defined only by difference, only by difference from whites. And so I tracked the arguments and reports about racial comparison in the late 19th, in the mid to late 19th century, and over the 20th century, and up to the present. And I think of this as a particular genre of medical study, and I hope we can talk more about that in our discussion. But I'll begin with, with how this comes about uh, by looking at the work of Samuel Cartwright, 1851, his report on the disease and peculiarities of the Negro race. And of course, he starts with uh, the very familiar, the color of the skin is the main difference. Um, but there were other more deep, durable, and indelible differences, he argued, including the membranes, the muscles, the tendons, all fluids and secretions, the brain and the nerves, the bile is of a deeper color, his blood is thicker, there's a difference in the flesh, his bones are wider and harder, the neck is shorter and more oblique, the spine more inward, the pelvis more outward, the thigh bone larger, the bones more bent, the legs curve outwards or bow, the feet are flat, the gastro muscles are smaller, the heel is so long as to make it appear as if planted in the middle of the foot, the projecting mouth, the retracting forehead, the broad flat nose, thick lips, woolly hair. But he also argued his hearing is better, the sense of smell more acute and sight stronger than the white man's, bears the sun better, veins are small. And then out of nowhere, he throws in this particular line, music is a mere sensual pleasure with the Negro. There's nothing in his music addressing the understanding. It has melody, but no harmony. His songs are mere sounds without sense of meaning, pleasing to the ear, without conveying a single idea to the mind. It's very strange in this catalog of differences that he throws in this particular uh, point about uh, music, which just even begins to, I think, um, help us understand what this kind of cataloging of difference is really about. Uh, and he continued, uh, I've thus hastily and imperfectly noticed some of the most striking anatomical and physiological peculiarities of the Negro race. The question may be asked, does he belong to the same race as the white man? Is he a son of Adam? Does his peculiar physical conformation stand in opposition to the Bible or does it prove its truth? So at the heart of these racial comparisons, as I noted earlier, is the question of how, what are these differences meaning and what is race and then ultimately what is the Negro? Okay. Um, he talked about various diseases as well, high rates of pneumonia, the uh, more susceptibility to fevers, colic, cramps, convulsions, nervous afflictions, diseases of the skin, uh, Negro consumption, which is re a reference to tuberculosis, uh, in a form that did not appear among whites. Drapetomania, the, the, this article is famous for his introduction of the notion of drapetomania, the insane desire to run away, which he considered to be a mental condition. Since the natural condition of the Negro was slavery, then and that Negroes were adapted to slavery, to run away from slavery had to be a mental aberration and a sign of mental disease. Also, uh, diesthesia, which uh, uh, argued uh, was, a, was a, uh, also introduced by him to refer to inadequate breathing. So that's Samuel Cartwright, 1851. If you move to Rudolf Matas, 1896, who's a very prominent physician in, in Louisiana, and in his piece, um, The Surgical Peculiarities of the Negro, the ear canal is larger and straighter, the nose wider, the skin is thicker, kinky woolly hair, less in sensibility to pain and shock, syphilis more widely prevalent and more fatal, tuberculosis prevalent and three times as fatal. Uh, but he found no differences in simple wound infections, no racial difference to streptococcal infection, but higher mortality, cancer formerly rare, but increasing in the 1890s, pulmonary, pulmonary tuberculosis was twice as prevalent and over three times as fatal. And indeed, the higher rate of tuberculosis alone would lead to the extinction of the Negro race. He concluded, the North American Negro is anthropologically, physiologically, and pathologically 
different from his original African ancestors and contemporary Africans. Surgically, the white and the Negro are practically alike, but the increase in cancers indicated a marked tendency toward degeneration. Also in terms of diseases, he is deteriorating in terms uh, due to competitions with superior whites. So I, I hope this sort of, this passion, uh, intensity, focus on comparing physical differences, physiological differences, throwing in at various times uh, notions of cu deep cultural uh, differences is a, by 1896 when Mattis is writing, a standard practice that you find all across various medical uh, uh, disciplines and a habit that I argue becomes deeply ingrained in medical theory and practice. So these physical comparisons of whites and blacks simply assumed that there were any biological, mental, physiological causes underlying the differences that they found. And they assumed that such causes were quote unquote racial and no further explanation was needed. You didn't have to run more experiment. You didn't have to make uh, a, a more sophisticated uh, observations. Um, by 1900, these differences cataloged under the notion of race was seen by biologists, anthropologists, and physicians as an integrated physical and linguistic and cultural totality. And I think that for many people today, and I'll get to this at the, at the end, uh, it's very important to realize that this is, is how physical, medical, and biological cultural differences between whites and black was, blacks was understood, and then how it became sedimented in medical theory and practice. So you jump from the early 20th century to the end of the 20th century, only at the end of the 20th century did medical researchers join with an increasing number of biologists and anthropologists to seriously interrogate both the concept of race and this practice of medical comparison. And, and, and as recently as, as 1992, if you consider that recent, um, the Journal of American Medical Association acknowledged that while publications about comparative racial research numbered in the thousands, the concept of race was at best elusive. So you have paper after paper that's quantifying, identifying these differences, right? Yet, there's no definition about, of race and there's no consensus about what racial differences actually mean. By the year 2000, you see in uh, something like Nature Genetics, this problem that had arisen in the use of comparative racial analysis that had spread even into genetic research uh, had threatened to undermine the claims of geneticists that race was no longer a useful way to study human variation. Um, and they noted that throughout history, scientists have used social and political determined racial categories to make scientific comparison between races with little or no discussion about the meaning or the rationale. At present, the messages were mixed. That's in 2000, 20 years ago. On the one hand, the public is told that there is no more variation within populations than between populations. On the other hand, scientists use racial terms when describing re racial re research results such as an increase in risk for breast cancer in Jews or prostate cancer in Blacks. And it, it had caused the editors of Nature Genetics to argue that they were going to require authors to explain why they made use of particular ethnic groups of populations and how classification was achieved. Uh, they're in, interrogating their, their, uh, the results of this call in 2000 suggests they haven't quite gotten to uh, achieve the goal that they set out for themselves. But it's really interesting that these ideas from the past, that's why I wanted to give you this litany of things, of differences, just two examples with Cartwright and with Mattis, how these ideas from the past simply live on. So here's a piece from January, uh, last January, 2020, that was in the, uh, in the uh, journal of the um, AAMC, AAMC. Uh, on the tr 
the, how half of white medical trainees believe such myths as black people have thicker skin or less sensitive nerves than white people. Um, and uh, comments such as black people's nerve endings are less sensitive than white people's, black people's skin is thicker than white people's, black people's blood coagulates more quickly than white people's, and they are not just 19th century uh, relics, and they're certainly not forgotten. They are notions that are still being held by far too many medical students and residents, as recently in this paper, noting 2016, but it certainly continues. In fact, in this uh, report, comments on the uh, piece that was published in uh, PNAS, um, that 40% of first and second year medical students endorse the belief that black people's skin is thicker than white people's. Would have been comfortable having a conversation with Cartwright and with Mattis. Um, and, but what we know now is that these ideas, the labeled false, the labeled false, and we can talk about that, um, can lead to worrisome uh, treatment um, disparities. Um, in the 2016 study, for example, in this last line, trainees who believe that black people are not as sensitive to pain as white people were less likely to treat black people's pain appropriately. In 2020, um, it's noted in JAMA, uh, where we now have enormous attention in this past year, because of, in part because of COVID, in part because of confrontation, because of the ways in which, which across di disciplines and across our, our, our cultural and social landscape, discussions of race have become much more prominent. You'll see, you'll see uh, analysis like this. Uh, the medical literature, that uses or discusses race is vast, but what does it tell you? In December 21, uh, a search of PubMed, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, yielded 518 some thousand items, whereas one with, uh, with focused terms such as African-American and Hispanic or Latino. And these ones yielded almost 50 and 60,000 uh, items uh, specifically. And, but what you find now is um, despite the fact that there's so much material out there, so many investigations, it's not clear what these investigations actually tell us. We do, I mean, many people now recognize the poor performance of race as a measure. Uh, numerous passionate health professors, uh, health, health professionals have been shouting about this for a very long time. Um, and certainly what's been apparent in the last few months is medical students are, um, and certainly medical students of color have begun to really demand changes in medical education and curriculum because of this kind of material and the kinds of ways in which making uh, statements about racial differences has become so visible and so problematic in so many ways. And now people are even asking, why should race variables be used at all? Um, and in the same article, uh, the question was raised about what you do in future investigations. Uh, four steps were addressed. Execute a systematic review of prior research because race may have been exhausted as a tool and it is, and is futile to study again or may offer insight for how a new study may best leverage past work or create novel hypotheses. Now, I would argue against step one with great um, that one should undertake, step one, I should say, with great care. A systematic review of prior research of the, of the idea that African Americans uh, experience pain, uh, or have less sensitivity to pain than whites. Again, it's so deeply embedded in medical theory and practice. How do you take it out? Is it just a better study? Is it to really come to terms with what uh, uh, race means and is and what's the best way to measure it? Do we just need new tools or do we new, need new analytical frames altogether? Is it better data that we need to dispense with that notion? Or do we need to think differently about the, the very idea that black bodies and white bodies are fundamentally different? And um, the fourth uh, on their list is uh, carefully considered the potency of any race-related research 
engage a holistic portfolio of clinical and social consequences, including the amelioration or aggravation of existing inequalities. And that means to take, to step back from this notion that we can think of the body uh, as either uh, our bodies or bodies uh, as either simply biological or simply social or, or simply affected by biology or simply affected by culture and understand that it is an integrated whole. Biology and culture working in consort in particular environments under particular social systems and all of that together shapes what we see and observe and what in the past were just observable differences without much attention to context. So I end by saying, you know, it's just that race does not sit outside of the medical world. Uh, it has, as one scholar noted, uh, quote, part and parcel of the authors, the journals, their disciplinary fields, their ongoing practices and institutions, and all of them together form this web of relations among the social in its widest sense, the genetic, the medical, and the epidemiological, a web in which race has played a continuous role, constantly evolving and constantly being transformed. It is that malleability of race that has moved us from 1850s to the present, and we could still ask the same question. Do Blacks actually have a less in sensitivity to pain? So that's where I wanted to stop. Thanks. Incredible, that's a, a great mic drop. <laughs> um, thank you, Professor Hammonds, as well, for your uh, incredible comments. And, and again, thank you, Professor Conniff. I wanted to, before we jump into some of the questions in the Q&A, um, you know, again, very excited for the opportunity to, um, to, to support and moderate this discussion. You both brought up such profoundly important historical um, references and, and have uh, brought it forward to 2021 in a way that I hope will be tremendously helpful for, for my profession, uh, medicine. Um, I wanted to just share a couple of quick reflections and I'd like to kick us off by asking each of you a question myself and then we'll, we'll start to bring in some of the questions from, from the Q&A. Um, I just want to also highlight, uh, because I didn't have a chance to do this at the beginning, how important I think it is that we, uh, the three of us, Professor Connors, Professor Hammonds, and myself represent uh, a number of disciplines from law to philosophy to history to engineering to medicine to public health and I just want to highlight how uh, unfortunately uncommon um, the kind of dialogue we're going to have across professions happens um, and yet when we look at racial health inequities and health inequity in general, um, we often go astray if we don't make it an interdisciplinary cross-professional um, conversation. So I'm excited for that opportunity today. I also want to just highlight how relevant um, the field historical and current of social medicine is for our conversation today. It's a, a tradition that dates back, of course, to the 1840s and uh, Rudolf Virchow being widely considered one of the fathers of this field. And it relates profoundly to what Professor Conniff mentioned around social determinants of health and that um, direction, let's say, being relevant for the conversation about how we achieve social justice in medicine and in health and well-being in general. Um, and also, I think, takes us beyond social determinants uh, to structural change. Social medicine is really about the recognition that, um, you know, inequity and in health outcomes is socially and structurally driven and therefore the solutions to those inequities must include structural change, um, not just social change but structural change and and it also recognizes, I think, that the biomedical model, which is the model that most of us in the health professions are trained in, uh, is profoundly insufficient um, to achieve health and well-being. And also that, you know, in many ways, and I can say this as an internal medicine doctor, clinical medicine is palliative uh, when it comes to the larger social and structural drivers of poor health. And so if we consider that, um, you know, social medicine, I think, helps us to understand not just patterns that we see in you know, the pandemic uh, that we're experiencing right now in COVID, but helps us to understand social inequity and inequity and in health outcomes in 
every disease. And I think that those patterns are patterns that we as folks in the health professions have to be much more well versed in to be able to interrupt the cycle once and for all and stop allowing that pattern to be the pattern that predominates with the next pandemic and the next pandemic and the next pandemic. Um, I, I want to just mention briefly also that uh, there, and, and Professor Hammonds alluded to this, there has been rising interest in these issues, um, and, and JAMA certainly is one of the, the journals that has taken that up, and uh, this question of how we use race in clinical algorithms and clinical tools has certainly certainly been one that has uh, gotten lots of headlines in, in the health professions in the most recent several years, in large part, as you mentioned, because of the activism and organizing of medical students and community organizers and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but I think it's one of those spaces that really brings your uh, historical, uh, cultural, um, legal analysis to the modern day urgent um, in racial inequities that we're facing. And it's fascinating because it is incredibly controversial even uh, to, uh, to critique the use of race, for example, in the clinical algorithm that calculates kidney function. Um, for those of you that are well versed in this debate, and, and Professor Conniff mentioned Bill Dill, it's not dissimilar. Um, uh, but it's incredibly controversial to uh, no longer correct kidney, quote unquote, correct kidney function for race. Um, and even scholars of color in the field of medicine are suggesting uh, that we should continue that practice. And yet when you look at the history of it and you look at how it connects to uh, a similar challenge, uh, the National Football League, the NFL, has gotten uh, some, some recent um, critique and press for using race-based standards for um, qualifying for dementia, for example, as well. So um, this is relevant in many, many spaces, and, and certainly kidney function and cognition are not the only spaces. And yet, uh, to your point, Professor Hammonds, it is still unclear what this tells us, and the debate uh, seems to be, unfortunately, uh, not well grounded enough in the history of everything that you both just described about where these narratives of Black difference or the physician's Negro, where that actually comes from. So I hope we can get into some of that uh, for sure. Um, I would also just note that um, uh, because of my recent work with the Ways and Means Committee, this is something that politicians, I think, are also, uh, and policy makers are really uh, paying quite a bit of attention to. So I hope we can get into some of that. So with that, I want to ask Professor uh, Conniff the first question, and then I'll go to Professor Hammonds, and then I'll start to bring in some of the questions from you all in the Q&A. So please, um, uh, I, I only see six questions in the Q&A, so please bring, bring some more questions in there. I, I promise we'll get to those very shortly. Um, so Professor Conniff, uh, I really, really appreciate it. Um, everything that you said. It was incredibly helpful for me as a physician um, to hear some of the history around um, not just the first face of oppression, but the contagion narrative, how that uh, led to segregation eugenics and pathogenesis uh, as well. Um, and I really appreciated your mention again of the social determinants of health as an opportunity um, for us to really reflect on social justice within medicine, and again, work across disciplines. So the question I wanted to start uh, with you uh, for was, how, how do you see the role of folks like myself? What is the role of health professionals um, in some of the work you described around legal strategies to get us closer um, to racial equity, to not misusing and misclassifying um, based on race? How, where do you see um, uh, nurses, physicians, and other health professionals in that work of developing uh, legal strategies for, for moving us forward? And uh, you're muted. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, I a lot of the strategies that I refer to are designed to uh, try and shape the uh, reshape the medical profession, right? So, you you talked about the interdisciplinary nature of this panel, um, and you know, I should say that 
what law often does is we just were parasites, right? To a large degree, we draw on the expertise from other disciplines, right? Um, and now we have some amazing people who have a PhDs in history and sociology who work in the law and really bring those disciplines to the law. We even have some MDJDs. I am not one of those people, right? Um, and so, um, and so, you know, I I just try and draw what I can, and I you know have have limited understanding. But 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 part of the idea is. Um, you know, what, what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out ways in which law can change uh, medicine and medical discourse, right? Um, so Professor Hammonds um, spoke a little bit about how race is malleable. Uh, one of the points I want to emphasize is that medicine is malleable as well, right? Um, and, so, um, and so I think that um, one of the ideas is law trying to change medicine. Now, of course, if there was some way in which we could directly, right, um, inculcate these ideals within the medical profession without law's intercession, that would be great, right? Now, I'm not going to talk about those because A, I don't know much about that and B, I don't want to put myself out of a job, but I think that, uh, that, 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 that it is critical to um, find ways in which to transform uh, these ideas. And so the study that Professor Hammonds referred to, um, I, I think it was the 2016 study about half of medical students, you know, um, have these ideas, but it is only half, right? And if you go to physicians, right, who are practicing, the numbers go to 70, 80%. Right, and now we're beginning to see, um, you know, uh, th some of these um, changes being called for within um, by by medical students. Right, so I, I think there is hope, um, and, and and so now I think one of the key questions here, and I'll I'll stop with this ramble here, is whether we should remove race from the conversation in medicine or whether we should transform it, because I actually think that we'd be unsuccessful if we said, let's just remove race. I think what we need to say is that race represents a category of social relations and needs to be studied in that way because racial minorities do experience harm and that harm comes from social oppression. Um, and it is wrong categorically to think about this in biological terms and it is necessary to think about this in social terms. But I think that um, that requires the integration of broader uh, social narratives in medicine. Powerful. Thank you for that. So I appreciate that that um, framing and appreciate your your suggestions um, around how, uh, again, how we may forge a path forward. And certainly excited to continue a conversation about how law can help us get to where we need to be in medicine. I think that um, that is a, a a conversation ripe for 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 deeper questions and reflections for sure. Um, and I also want to make sure I I'm clear that I think what a lot of folks are saying about uh, EGF are, for example, kidney function calculation, for example, is not that we should no longer co collect data or demographic data about race or ethnicity, uh, but that we need to completely reconsider how we use it in clinical medicine and that the, the point of measuring, uh, you know, outcomes, clinical outcomes by race is to understand and document and clarify the impact of racism rather than um, promoting any biological difference between the races. And um, and that's a perfect transition to my question for Professor Hammonds. And again, I see some great questions in the Q&A, so keep, keep throwing them in there. I'm going to uh, kind of curate them a little bit and make sure we get to many of the themes. Um, so along those lines for Professor Hammonds, um, very much appreciate your framing of the physician's Negro and, again, this idea that um, uh, blackness is only defined by difference. Um, it is so clear and pervasive in the way that we practice medicine, unfortunately, and yet um, we can't seem to get ourselves out of that cycle of doing it. Um, and as, as both of you mentioned, we're, you know, hundreds of years into the development of the profession, of the health professions, and yet these patterns persist and the dialogue can't seem to jump and leap forward. Um, and so for you, I wanted to, um, Professor Hammonds, ask you a little bit more about um, your work on uh, this idea of race correction in lots of the different clinical algorithms. You've been uh, an outspoken voice on this. Would mm -hmm. love to hear uh, anything you want to say about that and also how you think um, we should continue the conversation, especially for those of us who are people of color in the health professions, um, because some Sometimes we also um, support those ideas of continuing a biological difference without realizing it. So I, the race correction issue is, 
is, is uh, first, it's, it's not surprising. So one of uh, uh, postdoctoral uh, fellow who worked with me, uh, Lundy Brown, her wonderful book on uh, race in the machine about early measurements of lung function, which began in the Civil War. And, uh, and, and, and even with those sort of old versions of the machine to measure, measure lung capacity, there's a race correction. Why is there a race correction? Because they believe that black lungs and white lungs were different. So once you build it into the machine, then that's the issue. Black lungs and white lungs are different. How many times do we have to question that? And then if it's the confirmatory process of having the machine tell you, and also but you have to set, right, what those levels are. Um, and, and then how this, how, and, and of course, then the next step is uh, interpretation of the reports that you get. So one of the things that's happening here for me in, in the race correction is, uh, it, and, and I said it in a general way in my remarks, is how deep these notions of difference go means that we have to almost interrogate everything. There should be a question about everything. So is, uh, you know, here we have a machine that tells us that there needs to be a correction for measuring uh, lung capacity right in the middle of COVID, right? When they're saying, if you had those small ventilators, when were you supposed to go to the hospital? If you were a black person, you were supposed to go at one number. If you were a white person, you were supposed to go at another number. And I was looking at this, I said, oh my God, if I get sick, I, don't, I do not know what to do. I don't trust the machine. I don't trust what the race correction into the, is in the machine, but I could die while I'm sitting here having my intellectual conversation about <laughs> these things. And so that, I mean, real lives are at stake in this process of race correction that has occurred. So, I mean, you, you, you're seeing now over the course of this year, sub-discipline after sub-discipline after sub-discipline now coming forward with, with commentary about how they do their work. The other one that was really striking was dermatology. So a very few African-American practitioners in and practitioners of color in dermatology. But right in the middle of COVID, of course, right, there was this moment where there was this uh, discussion about discoloration of fingers and toes. And stories by a, a very powerful one, I thought, in the New York Times by uh, an African-American dermatologist. And she said, you know, people were coming in and looking at Black people's hands and, 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 and uh, toes and saying, I, I don't, the white doctor saying, I don't see anything. I, I don't see any discoloration, right? Or even machines that also had correction for color. And so again, you could get, a, well, this kind of discoloration may not be to the point that should be used as a, a marker of a presence of COVID. That, that goes so far into this story that my, my real basic point here is we have to question everything. Every time something is presented as um, a racial difference, we have to ask, how is it different? Why do we believe that? Where did this idea come from? And should it be subjected to um, unbiased observation and measurement? And, and that means, and that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work for, for clinicians, but you have to ask the question because if we don't ask these questions, we will simply continue to accept without questioning that these differences exist and this is what they mean and it will shape people's, uh, and it will shape the outcomes and it will shape whether some people live or die. So uh, Michelle, I really feel that um, I, the job of clinicians now is in the, in the whatever subfield you work in, is to really, really question the basic premises uh, in your field that speak to the issue of racial differences. And, you, and, 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 if there, and if it goes back to lessen sensitivity of pain in the 19th century, you know how much work you have to do to turn this around. We don't, I, I mean, I think, um, and, and, and I am exaggerating a little bit to say that it has, I'm not saying it's remained the same over, the, over that long period of time, but there are elements that have remained the same. Um, and, and the point is to try to get clear about which ones are the same and useful and which ones are not useful and represent bias. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I think your point about asking critical questions and how we build in critical consciousness as a part of health professions education um, are such important, important, important critical issues. So I, I very much appreciate that. And and in the Q and A, I'm seeing I'm seeing some great questions. Thanks to everyone who's putting um, questions in the Q and A. We appreciate it. Um, someone was flagging this issue of the fact that the the pulse oximeter, the machine that measures oxygen saturation has been shown to be significantly less accurate in black patients and has been shown for at least two decades. I mean, um, that research goes back quite some time and yet we see an inaction um, when it comes to the technology and changing um, how we might measure that. I think that lifts up again the, this need to ask critical questions. And um, if any of you want to respond to why the pulse ox machine has not changed or been critiqued, um, you're welcome to. And I think the, the question about sickle cell um, uh, being a black disease um, or, or cystic fibrosis, for example, being a white disease, um, that of course also is a huge question for those of us in the health professions. How can we change those stereotypes? Because we also know that we systematically underdiagnose cystic fibrosis in non-white people, in fact, uh, because there are plenty of non-white people who have cystic fibrosis. So um, I want to throw that out there. I also want to throw out there um, this uh, very interesting question, and this may be more for Professor Conniff, about why there aren't policies for accountability in the medical field for racial and ethnic disparities. I think that builds um, very nicely on what you propose. So um, any reactions to that series, uh, uh, that, that uh, interconnected series of, of questions in the, in the Q&A? Uh, yeah, I would, I would really like to hear uh, Craig reflect on this. I mean, if we find out that, um, you know, the pulse oximeter is really measuring um, what happens in, for, for uh, 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 introducing a bias into the uh, measurements uh, for Black people, then you have to ask, uh, where, where, is our, where is our possibility for getting accountability? So if, and if, you know, so if you end up with subsequently more severe uh, illness, um, then do you get to sue? And who do you get to sue? Do you get to sue the, the doctor? Do you get to sue the makers of the machines? Um, especially if the documentation they present says, well, we've known for a long time that, you know, uh, this, is, this difference is true. Uh, so how, how do we get inside of that box? Yeah, so, um, so just um, an answer with my lawyer hat, though, of course, this doesn't constitute legal advice and all of that. But yeah, so, so, uh, so you can sue under section, section 1557 of the ACA. Let's say treatment, a certain kind of treatment has been denied, or you can sort of show that you've suffered harm, then you can sue and, you know, you can ask for injunctive relief that, um, that prevents the, uh, or, or that changes the way, the, the way this is used. Um, but I also just want to add this, right? So one of the questions, uh, so I, you know, I'm still heavily involved in the LGBT rights movement. And um, one of the questions we, you know, we were asked, we, we would ask ourselves is, you know, we keep saying that, you know, gay people are born this way, right? Uh, to quote, I think it was Christina Aguilera, right? But if I got that wrong, I apologize to my LGBT brethren. I'm very bad at pop culture. Um, and so, um, and so, or I think it was Lady Gaga. But anyway, I, I digress. Uh, the, the point, the point is that, um, the point is that uh, if it turns out that we were not, we are not born this way, if the studies do not show that, um, are we opening up ourselves to a narrative that actually gay rights should not be uh, um, sh 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 should not be uh, there? And are we opening up ourselves to medical practices that would transform um, um, gay people into straight people? Right now, I think that I, I think that the science just suggests that even those categories are non nonsensical, right? And the concept of conversion is nonsensical. But you know, um, but that was a fear in the in the you know um, in the early '90s and the early 2000s when I when I joined the movement, um, and um, and yet it came to pass that uh, the idea of immutability was cited in Obergefell versus Hodges that granted marriage equality. Right, um, and so there is often a cost-benefit analysis, and I think one of the questions here is this: um, We know for a fact that um, uh, that African Americans live in places of high pollution, right? Um, that causes physical harms, um, and as policymakers, 
um, in, in order to persuade policymakers that action is needed on various fronts, um, one of the things that are documented is the of uh, physical harms that black people face because of the environmental and other forms of racism they experience. So how do we document those harms without at the same time reinforcing narratives of inferiority? Because, you know, as you point out, there are many metrics, there are, there are many metrics of measurement that are false, but at the same time, we know that there are metrics that, that, that truly show that black people are hurt and are harmed regularly by the policies we experience, right? And so therefore I think that um, one thing that can be done is not just, is, is to try and shift the pathology from race to racism, right? Um, and, and, and to basically say that this is where the harm occurs. Right, uh, and I think that that is that that that, that is perhaps the, the a point of you know where we can transform the discourse in a certain in a certain way. Powerful, Professor Hammonds, did you want to add something to that? No, I, I think that I think that makes sense, and 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 I also um, I, I think again focusing in on on you know where the harm occurs, uh, how the harm is is manifest, is is really important in this, which again requires. An interrogation of, of deeply of, of um, widely used practices and deeply held uh, theoretical positions uh, on difference that have to be uh, that people will have to come to terms with. And as you noted earlier, Michelle, uh, even among uh, pra uh, um, health uh, practitioners of color, there's a debate about whether or not uh, we still should continue to uh, use. Um, notions of race that we have not been able to reframe to actually uh, reflect, you know, some modern, more quote unquote modern ideas about uh, biology and, 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 and bodily difference. Absolutely. I think, I mean, and I think it's conversations like these, right? It's, it's certainly not to pat ourselves on the back at all, but these things have to be worked through, right? They're not going to snap, go away. And so um, very much appreciate that. I, I'm seeing kind of two more um, big questions I want to throw out to Professor Conneth and Professor Hammonds next. Um, there's this great uh, thread within the Q&A about, um, you know, the fact that, you know, race is socially constructed and, and, Interestingly, I think in the health professions, you see more and more people hopping on that bandwagon and saying, yes, I believe race is socially constructed. And yet at the same time, they may support policies or clinical tools that actually use a, a rely on a biological definition of race. And so uh, folks are asking kind of, you know, does this, because social, uh, race is socially created, politically created, should it be erased in the medical research? And we, we alluded to this, but I think we can go, I think we can go even deeper because this is a thread that is incredible complex, but also we can make it simple. <laughs> um, so I'm going to throw that out there. And then along with that, um, there's this thread about how some of this um, biological difference between races, this false belief that there are biological differences between races, gets encoded in algorithms and artificial intelligence. And um, there's been a lot of conversation about papers recently, particularly in the medical field, showing, uh, I'm going to uh, just summarize the one that that folks have been talking about the most, which is the review of an insurance claims database that found that white patients were significantly more likely to use a high volume of care or, you know, be in contact with the health system more frequently, which made them uh, look you know, quote, more expensive, essentially. And then this algorithm used the uh, kind of cost or the volume of care that a patient was using as a variable in predicting which patient should get additional case management services, essentially, to help them control their disease. And so Black patients tended to be sicker and use care less and were systematically kind of... Um, misinterpreted or misconstrued in this algorithm. Uh, and it ended up meaning that black patients, despite being sicker, kind of got less case management services and care. So those two things are connected, right? I mean, you know, again, like how do we actually operationalize a social political construction of race definition? And then how does our misinterpretation of race in uh, you know, artificial intelligence and other algorithms lead us astray and how do we get ourselves out of that? 
Well, it seems to me one of the problems about algorithms that, that I've been trying to understand, and, I, and I'll be perfectly honest, I really didn't want to get into this one. I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this, this is going to be another, you know, uh, really, you know, torturous journey. But it's hard for algorithms to actually, and in the very case you mentioned, where's the context, okay? If, if, if we just took a place, um, if we took an example, say, a vaccine uptake in uh, rural Alabama, well, the, health, the public health uh, infrastructure in rural Alabama has been decimated. And so, and they don't have a, a, a really robust uh, transportation system. They don't have a, a, a really, uh, they, outside of also the public health infrastructure being decimated, there's not a, a, a large population of physicians. And so you could run, you could start an algorithm that only measures uh, how many people got the vaccine or went to possible, you know, made attempts to get the vaccine. And what did that show? It would show that the black, that black people didn't get as much vaccine. Is it because they're black or because they were in this place where it was not possible to do so in any reasonably, in any reasonable way? Does the algorithm capture the context? Or does it capture something that's now labeled as uh, black people's behavior toward getting vaccines. If it's the measure black people's behavior for getting vaccine, that's just totally wrong. It doesn't measure that, right? And it can't be attributed to them being black. It's attributed to the social, political, public health and medical infrastructure in the state of Alabama, most explicitly in rural areas. So if the algorithms can't capture social determinants of health, and then it won't capture social determinants of health. And we'll be back to trying to understand what some kind of aberrant and irrational, some kind of behavior that's being characterized as aberrant and irrational because the black people in the sample, in the files, in the claims, didn't do what the white people did. So these, to, 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 I, I study computer science. I, I'm, I'm, I, I am not anti-computer science, but you can't craft the question in that way. The questions that you want the algorithms to provide answers to have to be crafted with a great deal of nuance and complexity to capture at least some part of the social determinants that then don't leave us at the end again with some, some outcome that just simply says Black people didn't behave like white people. So beautifully stated and clear. I'm sure Professor Conneth wants to, to jump in too, and I, I'm going to throw in just this one other question that came in about France no longer collecting race data, similar in Cuba, other places, etc., um, if you're able to bring that angle in. Absolutely. Um, I, I should say before my gay card is taken away, it was Lady Gaga. I apologize uh, profusely. Um, and so, uh, so, um, so, so, uh, you know, just a couple of thoughts. Um, so algorithmic bias is a problem, um, not just in, in medicine, but also in contexts uh, that are non-medical, right? And that, uh, that, that, that sort of uh, purportedly recognize that race is a medical construct. And, you know, um, I think about uh, my former colleague Sandy Mason's article, Bias In, Bias Out, that appeared in the Yale Law Journal a couple of years ago, right? The data is biased, right? And then beyond that, the correlations that are drawn and the, cause, and the, and the causal pathways that are somehow intuited from the data um, are further biased. Um, and again, I, so I think that there are ways in which we can um, co correct for these, but all of this has to be done right, using the strategy that Professor Hammond uh, describes, which is interrogate everything, but interrogate everything from the perspective that racism is inbuilt and it's baked into the system, right? So that is something that has to be taken as a premise. And, you know, and, 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 you, and some may say, oh, well, you know, why would you take that as a premise, right? Um, doesn't that bias the data? Well, the data is already biased because we take race biological difference as a premise already. Right, and so um, and so and so, if if you need to think of it this way, um, think of it as a corrective, right, to the way we've um, we've uh, we've uh, uh, you know historically historically collected um, the data. Um, I had one more point, and I forgot it, so I'll, I'll stop there. That's no, that's amazing. 
beautiful, so beautifully stated. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm learning new tactics and tools from both of you as this conversation <laughs> continues. And from what I can see in the Q and A, it sounds like all the participants are as well. And I wanna, um, I know we're just about at, we're getting close to time. So I wanna kind of throw out one final question for like a 60 second reflection from each of you. Uh, and then we'll pass it over to Professor Kesselheim to close us out in just a moment. Um, but I do think, I, I mean, again, I think the Q and A has been phenomenal. I think this question about whether or not we collect any race and ethnicity data at all is one that will continue to be uh, will be continue to be debated. Um, but I just want to throw out this last question about you know, and Professor Conniff, you alluded to this critical race theorists, of course, tell us that racism is pervasive. That that needs to guide how we ask our research questions. And certainly, um, folks like Professor Chandra Ford, who who developed critical a uh, public health critical race praxis, similar approach. Um, I want to throw out a question about reparations and um, and specifically because uh, colleagues and I just uh, had a paper published in the past couple of days about the fact that if we had instituted reparations prior to the COVID pandemic, transmission of COVID would have been decreased by anywhere between 30 and 68 percent. Um, and this was based on a, a model uh, comparing how COVID spread in Louisiana because of the deep uh, history of racism and racial inequity there and the COVID pandemic being severe there, uh, compared with how transmission happened in South Korea, kind of a, you know, a model of control essentially for, for COVID, um, and looked specifically at how different the variables for folks who were able to control the pandemic versus folks in Louisiana, for example, be it exposure because of your, uh, your job, how, congregate housing, et cetera, all of those kinds of things. And so uh, if you have a reflection on um, how we could apply a reparations framework to um, longstanding racial health inequities, if we should, if that if that's the kind of thing we should be doing, um, any reflections on that uh, are welcome. As, a, as a, unfair to give you sixty seconds each, but <laughs> but any final reflections on that are, are welcome, and then we'll pass it to Dr. Kesselheim. Well, I, you know, I, I I I'm not sure I would have I would have uh, referred to my idea as as a reparations framework as much more of a kind of um, public health and and medical framework that that takes seriously uh, the environment and takes seriously the social, the social context. So for example, when the CDC says, uh, okay, COVID, people need to social, be social distancing, right? Instead, instead of saying that, it should have said, what makes it possible for people to keep, uh, to, to engage in social distancing? If you ask that question, then, you, then where you look is not, at people who live in big houses and, and can work remotely in their individual rooms, but you look at places where people simply cannot stay apart and you begin to think of innovative ways to provide them with space. Maybe you say churches ought to be used uh, in, in various neighborhoods as social spaces for a while until we get this under control so people can go to and sit separately in church all day long and be warm and be fed. We didn't ask, when we don't ask the question that way, then what we get is blaming the people who didn't seem to, to uh, engage in appropriate social distancing practices. Uh, and they didn't because they couldn't. Many people couldn't, some people chose not to, but many people simply couldn't. And so is, uh, if we constantly forget to put the social before the biological, these are the kinds of outcomes that we get. And so is that, to be included in a notion of, 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 of reparations, I think ultimately it could be. So I actually would distinguish reparations from, uh, from what we're talking about here, uh, because uh, to my mind, they're addressing different concepts, right? In theory, you could have an African-American community that experienced the same level of health, right? But because of past wrongs was still owed. Right. So I think that the point of reparations should be distinguished from, you know, the existing harm today. Um, and, and, and yes, I agree with Professor Hammonds, right? Measure existing harm uh, to the point that I forgot, but I think is relevant here is measure racism um, and, and the harms of racism don't measure race because that's not measurable. 
right? And so, and you know, we can think about Z codes, we can think about techniques to measure the harms of racism. There are frameworks out there. Um, and I think that that can be incorporated into critical um, race theory. Um, you know, so, uh, so, so Ruha Benjamin, for example, her work on technology and race is fantastic. But within law, um, there is an, an, an empirical critical race theory movement. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Dana Matthew was mentioned several times in the comments, the dear friend and um, dear mentor of mine. Um, and she, you, she held conferences on empirical critical race theory. Um, and I think that being able to incorporate uh, that from a health um, standpoint um, could, be, could be useful to truly understand uh, how these harms uh, play, around, you know, play, play with each other, um, to understand that these are social categories that, that can be measured and that racism can be addressed through that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Just sharing my thanks, that's all. <laughs> yes, thank you both very much. This was, uh, this was a, great, uh, a great session. I would call it, um, I would maybe call it the opposite of shallow. Uh, and you, uh, you know, I think you all gave us a million reasons why we should tune in. And, um, and I had a tough time keeping my poker face uh, set throughout the throughout the event, and in fact, I was I was happy and, and elated uh, to listen to you all. So um, those all, of course, also uh, Lady Gaga songs, Craig, and you can look them up afterwards. Um, thank you, uh, thanks all of you uh, for this, and um, and uh, please tune in next week. Uh, sorry, next month when we're going to talk about the future of healthcare reform. If you're interested, uh, make sure you sign up on the uh, um, Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics website. Um, for to be reminded of these events and, and once again I want to thank our our three distinguished um, uh, uh, panelists and, and discussants today uh, for a really excellent conversation hope everybody has a great uh, a great weekend <laughs>